Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you how you can implement the concept of feature management in .NET using a technique called feature flags. Now, the simple concept of a feature flag is the idea that you can enable or disable a feature in your application during runtime without having to recompile and re-add that code for that feature or even redeploy. All that can happen during runtime. So you can just have a toggle and say, I want this to be enabled or I want this to be disabled. Now, it sounds as simple as a Boolean, but as we're going to see in this video, it's going to get really, really advanced and Microsoft has a native package that you can use to implement that concept. So in this video, we're going to see all that and more. If you like that of content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe for more training. Check out my courses on domtrain.com. All right, so I'm sure what I have here. I have a simple .NET 8 API, and this is just the bare bones weather forecast API. Nothing special about it. You call an endpoint in returns five weather forecasts, and that is it. And we're going to use that to implement feature management through feature flags. Now, to do all that, we're going to be using a new package made by Microsoft. And it's actually one that has been around for quite a long time, since .NET Core 3, if I'm not wrong. This means that because it was made at that time, it is also very MVC heavy, which means that a lot of its features are for controllers, views, tag helpers, that sort of thing. However, it can be used for tons of other things, including minimal APIs. And in fact, in this video, I'm going to show you how you can adapt it to work as a filter for minimal APIs as well. Keep in mind, however, that this is not just for APIs. You can use that package for anything. It just has some native integration with APIs. So the first thing we want to do is go to NuGet and search for Microsoft.FeatureManagement.ASP.NET Core. And I'm going to use the pre-release version just to get the latest package in my project. So I'll go ahead and install that. And the first thing I get, the core of all this, is this I feature manager interface. So I can say feature manager, and now I can inject this I feature manager interface. Now, of course, this interface in order to be injectable needs to be registered. So I'm going to go into my services and say builder.services.add feature management, and this will add all the necessary services in my DI container. And once I have that, I can go ahead and use this feature manager interface. Now, let's say that the feature I wanna add is that, okay, for now we're returning five weathers. However, I wanna start returning 10 weathers in some cases. So I want to change a feature, not necessarily enable or disable it, but maybe make it so after a certain point where I say, true, yes, this is enabled, people can get up to 10 weathers, not just five. So to do that, what I can say is 10 weathers enabled, for example, assuming that's what I'm going to call this feature, and then say await feature manager dot is enabled async and give a name to my feature flag. Now, the naive approach would be to just say, for example, um, 10 weathers, uh, and that's the name of my flag. And I have to make this one async. However, you should not just have magic strings like this, especially for feature flags. So what you want to do is actually create a class and let's call that feature flags, for example, or maybe you can give it a better name depending on what you're doing. And this will have our strings as constants. So public const string 10 weathers. And I'm going to give that a name. And I don't like using the name of operator for things like this because it can make you accidentally refactor something that changes the name of this. And if the name of this flag also lives in something like configuration manager service, like launch Darkly, Azure app configuration, AWS app configuration, all that, then this can be very problematic. You can accidentally break things. So instead, what I like to do is just I have the string. This means I can refactor this if I want to, but the flag name stays the same. So I prefer that. So now I have that and I can go back here and say is enabled feature flags and then select the 10 weathers. And what I'm going to say here is that if 10 weathers is enabled, then return 10 weathers, otherwise return five. So I gave the responsibility to this feature over here, this feature flag over here to tell me if this feature is enabled or not. Now, somehow I have to load these flags. Where are they coming from? Well, they're coming from your configuration provider. The default one in .NET, especially in templates, is actually the app settings.json. So we can have it here. The way it works is you have a top level feature management object, and then in here you have your feature flag configuration. So let's say I call this 10 weathers, then I would go here and say 10 weathers, and I would say, for example, false. So my flag is false. And as things stands right now, I can go ahead and just say run. And if I go to Postman to call that endpoint, then as you're going to see, assuming my API is running, which it is, I'm going to get one, two, three, four, 
five weathers. However, the whole idea is that while the application is running, you can actually change that setting, change that flag, and you can say that this is actually now true. And by saving here, .NET by default refreshes during runtime the configuration of my application. So without restarting anything, I can go and say send, and now I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 weathers instead. I used a flag to enable the feature of returning more weathers in a single request. Now, maybe this is a very small and narrow example, but the whole idea is that you have a way to toggle something externally, even though the application hasn't restarted or required a redeploy or a new code version altogether. Now, you have to understand that something like this actually is a bit controversial for some people because you are having effectively a bloated version of your application where the new and the old co-live and the idea is that eventually you will remove the old and leave just the new in place but sometimes this can cause a situation where you have a bloated code base that never gets the old feature removed so I've seen feature flags work and I've seen them also not work. You need to be a bit disciplined as a team to do this well. However, I do think they're generally a net positive if they're done correctly. And you might be thinking, who's going to go ahead and just change an app settings or JSON file during runtime if you're running your app in production and so on? Well, you wouldn't. The idea is that you would be using something like AWS App Configuration or Secret Manager or something like this, which they all have live runtime refresh integrations in .NET. So you wouldn't need to update any of this. What you would do is you would go to your uh, portal or if you're using infrastructure as code there and you would change the settings externally on that system and that would cause a refresh during runtime. This can go way further. Imagine, for example, that you want to have a new version of an endpoint to your controller or a new controller altogether. What you could do is you can say example controller over here and I'm not going to properly implement it, but I'm going to just say controller base over here. Maybe that's an API controller and you can have a bunch of actions in here. But what you can do is if you want this to only be enabled by a specific feature flag, you can say feature gate. So you can have a gate based on a name of the flag. So let's say new control flag over here. And only if this flag is true, will this controller be registered. If it is not true, this won't even exist. You're just going to get a 404. And you could actually do that even on individual uh, action level. So if you have an I action result of some action over here, uh, then this could also have a feature gate flag. This is what I mean when I say that this package is old and it was made more with MVC in mind because you're going to find a lot of small things like this that you can realistically only use in MVC. But what happens if you want to have a similar thing in minimal APIs? Well, let's go ahead and implement that. Now, we can do this in a few ways. For example, if you go to app and you search for use feature, then you're going to see you have two methods here. Use for feature, which adds a middleware, which is sort of a branch in the pipeline and only go down that branch if that feature is enabled or you can even have the use middleware for feature where you can have again a middleware being triggered and sort of branch out in the processing of a request specifically for a feature but for minimal APIs you can also create a filter an endpoint filter because if you remember we also got the endpoint filter methods, add endpoint filter, and so on. So we're going to use this technique. What I'm going to do is go and create a new class and I'm going to call that feature flag endpoint filter. And that needs to implement the I endpoint filter interface, which only has one method, the invoke async method that returns a value object. I'm going to turn this into async and implement the handling. Now, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass down the endpoint name as a string. So I'm going to say endpoint name over here and i'm going to use that because i want this to be reusable for all of my endpoints so i don't create one filter per endpoint but have just one filter and then i pass down the name of the endpoint to differentiate between the two once i have that i'm going to go ahead and grab the feature manager over here and i'm going to get it from the http context requested services because this will make it easier to implement in my program.cs yes this can cause a few issues with testability but you can mock the http context and the services in here so you'll be fine once we have that we want to make sure that the endpoint is actually enabled so we're going to say is enabled i'm going to use the feature manager and say 
dot is enabled and I'm going to use a sort of a concatenated name. So I'm going to say endpoints underscore and then the name of the endpoint that I passed in the constructor. Then all I'm going to say is that if is not enabled, then return results dot not found. Basically, the endpoint does not exist. So you're going to get a 404 not to leak that this is behind the feature flag. Otherwise, we're just going to return the next thing in the pipeline, which eventually uh, will pass it down to the next thing and the next thing and eventually the endpoint. So that's all we need here in terms of the filter. And to make registration a bit easier, I'm going to make a new extension. That extension will look like this. I'm going to create a class called feature flag endpoint filter extensions, and I'm going to call that with feature flag. And then I'm going to pass down the endpoint name and then just register the filter for this endpoint with my endpoint filter and endpoint name. So back into my program.cs, if I want to have a second endpoint over here that has a slimmer version, let's say, of the weather, and I'm going to call that weather forecast slim, then what I can do is first completely remove this I feature manager thing. I don't need it. I'm going to turn this back to five, and I'm going to create a new weather forecast object that doesn't have, for example, over here, the summary. So I'm going to call that a slim version. So I'm going to go ahead here pass it down here, remove the summary, and that's it. Now, to put that behind the feature flag, what I'm going to say is with feature flag, and I'm going to give it the name of the endpoint, which is get weather forecast, and I'm going to rename that to get weather forecast slim to differentiate it from the core one. So that's all the work. The last thing I need to do is add the feature flag in my feature management settings. So I'm going to say endpoints because that's how I built my endpoint settings, and then feature management slim, and I'm going to call that false. And that is it. And now look what happens. I'm going to go and just run this API, and I'm going to try to call this slim endpoint, assuming I renamed the endpoint API route, which I did. Here we go. So if I go ahead and I call that, I'm going to get a 404, nothing happened. It looks like this thing does not exist. However, it does exist. It's just behind the feature flag. So if I go here and say, true and I save that and I call it again, suddenly it works and it doesn't have, for example, the summary. So we now hid an endpoint behind the feature flag in this very, very nice way. And you can have the two things co-living and eventually you can just remove the old stuff and only keep the new ones. Or if the new thing doesn't work out, remove the new thing without having to worry about breaking the old thing. But this does not stop there because, yes, this is cool and you can do tons of crazy things with this if you want to. But this new package also gives you the power to use three very interesting filters by default. And those are feature filters. We're going to start with the first one, which is the percentage filter. So as you saw, I have an extension method on the add feature manager. And you can have other things like add session manager, which gets into a bit more advanced stuff. But here we can have a percentage filter. And the way this works is that for a percentage of requests at random, uh, one thing can be both true or false depending on chance. So what you can do in this scenario is go back to app settings. And if I wanted for some reason that endpoint to exist 50% of the time and not exist for 50% of the time, I could do something like this. I could have this object here and then that has an enabled for object and an array of well, parameters that have to be satisfied for this to be true or false. And in this case, I say percentage parameters value 50. So 50% exists, 50% it does not exist. I'm going to go ahead and just run this. And now as I call this endpoint, it doesn't exist. It does exist. It doesn't exist. It does exist. It does exist. It does exist. I'm very lucky. Would what? I'm going to go buy a lotto ticket or something. So as you can see, now we have a 50% separation. Maybe you want to say 80%. And if you do that again, all during runtime, then you have that 80% exist, doesn't exist here as well. The other two filters we have are a bit more interesting and a bit more usable as well, because what's the point of having a percentage based thing on a request per request basis? Well, well, limited use case, but you can also have a targeting filter where you can use parameters about your user and the session and filter things based on that, which makes filtering a bit more consistent. So let's say you only want to allow a subset of users that have been in your platform for like more than two years to access those endpoints or those features, then you can do that because those are your most trusted users. Maybe you have VIP users and so on. That's how you can do that. And the other thing you could do is the time 
window filter, where you effectively say that a feature is only enabled for a limited amount of time during this time period, and then it does not exist. So this will allow you to achieve that. There's tons of ways you can take this. The package is very, very flexible. And if you're working with MVC, you're going to get more out of it than if you're working with minimal APIs. But I wouldn't be surprised if we also see minimal API features like the one we just implemented to allow us to do the same things we can do now with MVC. But I want to know from you, what do you think about feature flags in general? And did you ever have to use them? Leave a comment down below and let me know. Well, that's all I have for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, keep coding.